Namaste. So, I feel like yesterday's video was a tremendous milestone. And in a way, it represents the culmination of all my years of study, practice, contemplation, and so on. And in many ways, it represents the conclusion, the final conclusion of my work. I can't imagine <laughs> that anything bigger could come out of it. I mean, just to show the correlation between Vedas and the Buddha's teaching, it's enough, you know? And especially the Chatur Darshanam, the four views of Shankara being linked with the Buddha's teaching of Paticca Samupada. And this is a really big deal. So it's actually not my view, my discovery or teaching. All the credit goes to my gurus. And in my life, I've had five major gurus, but I've had so many more other gurus who taught me many useful and important things. So I just want to go through at least the major gurus briefly and give a summary of what they revealed to me. The first is A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. A.C. stands for Abhay Charanaravindam, which means the fearless lotus feet. And of course, Bhaktivedanta means that the ultimate conclusion of the Vedas is bhakti. Swami, of course, is a renunciant. Prabhupada means, according to him, that master at whom all masters sit. Means that master at whose feet all masters sit. So <laughs> these are pretty uh, high titles. But I think he deserved a lot of this credit because he was the one who brought the authentic Vedic literatures to the West. Now, anybody who's hung around yoga communities and like this know or should know that there's a lot of speculation, there's a lot of commercialization, there's a lot of oversimplification, and there's a lot of commerce and business getting mixed in with the yoga teachings to the point where they become just a caricature. But Bhaktivedanta Swami brought the authentic, at least the Bhakti Yoga and Karma Yoga teachings from Mahabharata and Srimad Bhagavatam, the Bhagavata Purana, and so many other literatures that he translated into English uh, in a devotional way for the first time. These had already been translated by scholars, but scholars are famous for speculating and adding their own biases. So the bias of a practitioner was a special way of looking at the Vedas that he was the first to introduce in the West. He was also the first to build a substantial organization. 
all over the world, actually. And even more amazing, he did this in only the last 12 years of his life. He came to the U.S. at age 72. Uh, I wouldn't dream of even attempting such a heroic feat. But he had the order of his spiritual master and his great grand spiritual master, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, to do this. So by following their desire and implementing their wishes, he gained immense potency. This is Guru Shakti. And Guru Tattva is one of the most important studies in spiritual life, period. So he introduced this properly in Western culture for the first time. Then there's Osho Rajneesh, Bhagavan. Uh, maybe uh, most of you are too young. <laughs> <laughs> to remember back in the 60s and 70s when he was called Bhagavan. And I think in a lot of ways he was riffing on Ramana Maharshi's uh, teachings, uh, but he studiously avoided going into Ramana's teachings in detail. Uh, he was kind of a trickster. He, was, he definitely had at least first path realization. But the way in which he presented his teachings was very tricky, very sophisticated, and he attracted a lot of sociopathic people to his organization. He really only cared about a small subset of his Hindi-speaking disciples. I think the rest of them were pretty much window dressing. <laughs> so the good thing about Osho was that he opened up the spectrum of teachings to a very wide degree. And he showed the connections between and among many different traditions, which is something that most teachers aren't willing to do. Another thing that he was deservedly praised for is he allowed his disciples to make up their own minds, which teachings and which methods they would follow. So he also introduced some very unique of his own methods, like dynamic meditation, kundalini meditation, and so on. I gained a lot from hanging out with him. And after I left the ranch in Oregon, I went to my place, sat down and meditated, and in just six weeks, I realized first path. So I owe him a lot of gratitude. Next is Bhikkhu Nyanananda. For two years, I searched up and down in Sri Lanka looking for a realized forest monk. And then, by a happy coincidence, uh, coincidence, <laughs> one of my earliest acquaintances on Sri Lanka, turns out she was one of his disciples. So she introduced me to someone who introduced me to him. And I went and visited him several times. And every time I visited him, I got my mind blown. And I also got deep insights into the Buddha's authentic teaching. Not Buddhism, uh, which is a, a religious path in a state of advanced degeneration, but the original teaching, which he gave to very qualified people about the real nature of Nibbana, meditation, and so forth. And so from him instructing me in these things, I was able to realize second, third, and fourth path in just three years. Then, after being a monk in Sri Lanka, I moved back to India 
and through another set of fortunate coincidences, I wound up living in Tiruvannamalai and becoming acquainted with Ramana's teachings. And again, this happened through very mystical connections through his dear friend Sheshadri Swamigal. So, both of whom had passed beyond, but still I had strong experiences of connection with both of them. Not with Ramana uh, Ashram, however, which again is a religious group and it has degenerated the teachings. I had a direct connection with Ramana and there was no reason to go through anybody else. And of course you can see on this channel so many series uh, having to do with Ramana's teaching. It was very influential on me and gave me my first taste of Brahman realization. So I'm very much indebted to him. And finally, here's a guru that probably very few of you have heard of. The Kanchi Paramacharya, Sri Chandrasekharendra Saraswati, Mahapariyava. He's very famous in India, but practically unknown outside of India. Here was a fully realized acharya, which means teaching by example, living the life, walking the walk. And he had immense mystical powers, but he never used them for his own benefit, only to help others. And there are some amazing, amazing stories about him. In fact, there's so many thousands of stories that there's no way that he could be a fake or fraud. Literally thousands of people have testified what a great soul he was. And some of you may ask, well, what, then what about your sannyas guru, uh, Sri Jnana Shakti Swami? Well, it's difficult because on the one hand, I don't have a picture of him. I have his ashes <laughs> and I have a, a deep connection with him. But there may only be one or two pictures of him in the, in the possession of his other disciples. And it's very difficult to get them to even show them to me. What to speak of copying them, taking photographs and like that. He expressed to me that he didn't want to become famous. He didn't want anybody to know about him. He just wanted to disappear. I offered to like make a YouTube channel for him and everything. He didn't want. He just wanted to fade away and merge with Brahman and that's what he did. But on the way, he saved and helped so many others, including myself. So that's just a capsule description of my gurus. I could go into much more detail on every one of them. And even I could find so many more teachers who helped me in various ways. But this is just a way to say thank you and offer my gratitude to those who helped me attain the greatest realizations in spiritual life and who have led me to deep realizations of Brahman. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Om Jnana Timiran Hasya Jnanan Jana Shalakaya Chakshunam Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gure Jalan Jalan Shalakaya Chakshura